Is it watch new? Probably. We're gonna have the team come through and show what their daily is on their wrist. Wow. <laughs> I'm gonna get his R7 plus some cash. The dudes are gonna think I'm going broke. This is the watch that means the most to me. We're gonna have a full-time security guard at the front. Huge discrepancy between new and mid. There's a scuff here at the 12. My favorite watch. I exceeded my weight limit. What's up, bud? Hey, it's Marco. How are you? Doing? Uh oh, Marco. What's up? <laughs> The class already put in tension. Yeah, just, well from that, it, just from the tension in the box. He was gonna do the same thing I'm doing. If he's a good watcher, and chances are he's buying a Patek, he's gonna look at the watch the same way I'm looking at it. And based on the chart that I drew out, this is where all the issues are. Now, is the watch new? Probably, but has it been mishandled? Yeah. You know, so but it's not like, is it, I, I would call it a very nice eye clean watch, meaning like when you look down at your wrist, it looks very nice. But if you start getting down to it with a microscope and a loop, you're gonna find issues. It's all about description and how it was sold to us. So if the watch was sold to you from your client as brand new, then the expectation is to receive a brand new watch. And that definition of brand new in this industry is like, you know, it's as plain as day, it's brand new. There's no issues. A lot of people, you know, in the situation would say, it's like, hey, it's brand new, but it's got handling marks. That would normally be disclosed. I think it personally, in my opinion, I think it's been worn maybe once or twice because it just has those indications of like, you know, death diving marks on the clasp, very small finding on the bezel means it was probably knocked up into something. So it's like, cause you gotta think if you're, if you're operating a brand new watch and you're taking in and out of a showcase, those same scuffs typically won't happen the same way would if you were wearing it. Well, you could hit the, you could hit the showcase with the watch, but that's typically a bad deal. Nine out of 10, when you hit a show, you've been with us long enough when we had those long show can we hit one on the way out you know right away it's just like an ugly feeling man, who was it that dropped that freaking watch on that marble floor over there oh i was there that day man that thing went to sliding mm -hmm. <laughs> like i said it looks really nice it may just, not even have an issue it's not, yeah yeah because we gave them such a stupid deal like right. the watch is super clean uh, as it is it's right. a super clean watch but if you really got me diving deep into what this watch really is, this is what it is. These are the marks that I'm finding. These are the scuffs. But that's, of course, under a microscope. It's not the worst just case in the world. It's just not yours. No, I, don't, I want to sell it. That's the thing. I know, I know but if you don't sell it. I know, but with the situation that's going on, you have to just plan. What's up, man? Hey, it's Marco. How are you, bro? Uh-oh. Marco, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Jesus Christ. I just caught uh, to inspect this watch, and obviously, like, it was sold to you as new. To me, the watch is new, but it obviously has like a little bit of handling marks, and that's that's all we wanted to disclose to you. Where? It looks like it's some on the clasp, you know, and I, it could just be because, you know, it's been in a showcase or something. There's just there's a couple of small, tiny, tiny, small scuffs that are like throughout on the end link. Let me ask you this. I don't know how well you know your customer. Is this something that I can look at, and then if it's no-go, return it, or is that not a thing? You know what I mean? Because you got to understand my eye position too, right? My eyes aren't there, which is tough. My notes would be the same notes you'd get. If we were both like, you know, in the same room with the same watch, we'd have the exact same opinion. You know what I mean? Like, that's why I'm calling you, because it's like right past my comfort level of selling somebody something as like true new versus like slider. It's nicer than a slider, but it's, not something I would say was like a brand new watch that was handled with care because there's like obviously like little issues here and there. That's why I wanted to let you let know. Me, so do, you, do we think that he'll, he'll do something on the money side then and I just take it? Man, I mean, that's the next call I was going to make. I Listen, I didn't know what type of deal you had going on. If this was something like you straight up had a sold order for a brand new true new, then I wanted to let you know personally like, hey, like... You probably want to either find another piece or you want to readjust this price. I'm going to try to talk to the client and say like, hey dude, we love you, but this is what I found on the watch. I have a, I literally draw, I draw out diagrams of these watches sometimes and I, especially when it comes to this type of money and I uh, literally notate every scratch on paper. So it's right. easy to show. Right. I mean, are there dings in the metal or are they more just surface scratches? Everything is surface except for one tiny, tiny area and it's a when I say it's like a tiny, it's a flea bite. Where? Uh, at is the, that the bezel? Yeah, but it's like, I, you really have to look hard with the loop to see it. So you have to use the loop to see it? I mean, I'm not trying to pass one over on anybody, but I need to be able to Everything that I'm thing. looking at requires a loop. Yeah, I appreciate the heads up because I don't like surprises. So what do you want to do? Do you want to talk Let to Let me call the client. See, yeah. Just call him and call me back. I mean, I'm I'm pretty reasonable guy. I mean, you, you're reasonable. You call me like sure we can work something out but just, yeah. i mean new is new new you know not new is not new so it's like we just got to find a, a happy medium so just call them and call me back i'm here all right i'll talk to you soon there's a scuff here at the 12 
there's a small little scratch there, at, you know, right around the 11 o'clock marker. There's chattering along the edge of this bezel. Looks like something kind of just lightly brushed up on the bezel and just kind of deemed it very small. I mean, it's, this is all really, really, really small stuff. And then there's a noticeable ding on the edge of the bezel right there. Another small scuff on the bezel. And then when you look at the watch at an overall glance, it's perfect. I mean, it really doesn't look like a big problem, you know? But at the end of the day, when we're selling these watches among big time dealers or, you know, we have to be thorough and you know, we have to perfect what we're telling somebody. Otherwise, there's nothing stopping this guy from doing the same thing I'm doing and coming back and saying, hey, you said this and this is what we got. I won't have much of an argument if I didn't do my job and notate what I saw as well. So, you know, I'm just being transparent with my client and his client and the client that sold the watch to us disclosed the watch as being 100% true, new, unworn, but this chart says otherwise. Here's the thing, if I was a retail client and I'm just glancing at this watch, I'm like, yeah, this is, this is a brand new watch. It looks great, it looks fantastic. I don't see any single, single problems because 90% of people that look at a watch, they'll wear it and they'll look this far from the watch every single time. They're not taking a loop. They're not running, you know, they're not skating the watch for issues. We are because it's our job because we know that there are clients out there that would 100% take out a loop. And I've had them come to my office many times. I've had, I've told clients, hey, it's a brand new watch. Yeah. First thing they do is whip a loop out of their pocket and they start going to, they start going to town on it. That's the one that they want to check. And can I blame them? No, because I'm telling them something. Therefore, it should be what I said. Yeah. And I shouldn't be hiding anything because I'm expecting my client to just be like, you know, that looks really good to me. I don't see a problem. Thank you, sir. Adios. And then it's a done deal. But it's just transparency in the industry that we have to keep keep up with. This is Marco with Grand Caliber. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. I uh, just wanted to let you know, I, I inspected your watch this morning. Um, Jai told me that the watch was supposed to be brand new, true new. And, you know, and I, I, I just wanted to let you know, like, after inspecting it, there's been, like, quite a bit of noticeable... Very small issues, but there's small issues that are throughout the whole watch. And it's kind of hindering us to sell it to the next person as new because there's some stuff that's obviously, it's all under the loop, but there's small scuffs, um, small scuffs. The Patek 5980, sorry. Okay, because I just moved it out of the showroom, that's all, and then I kept it in my locker. Because of the locker, probably it might have got, but I just moved it. You see, it. he yeah. wore it. Exactly how it, it, exactly what I told you. Uh, so what do you have to offer now? I just wore um, out of the boutique ones. Okay. And then I kept it in the locker. Because of the locker with other watches, it might have got that, but I actually never wore it. Got it. Well, I mean, listen, the, the fact of the matter is, whether you wore it once, never wore it, et cetera, et cetera. That's the handling of the watch that's most important when we're buying a watch brand new. So whenever it's coming, you know, coming through our hands, we need to, you know, be sure if it's new, you know, cause a lot of times, like when a watch is bought brand new, 95% of the time it, sh it would have been kept in the box and then just transported that way as such and then shipped. And then when we receive the watch, there's like no sign of uh, actual damage or anything like that other than maybe a hairline from wiping it off or something. But this watch has like significant sh uh, signs of use on the strap. I'm sorry, not on the strap, but on the gold part of the buckle. Uh, and then there's significant signs of use throughout the head of the watch. And again, this is preventing us from selling it to the next guy as new because we picked it up with our loop. And obviously, you know, I'm using a powerful loop, but the problem is when I sell it to the next guy, they tend to do the same thing to us. So they take their loops out and then we just get back and forth. And I'm just letting you know, like, you know, as much as we'd love to obviously keep the ball rolling forward, we just need to discuss, you know, how we want to handle this. See, if you see the leather strap is not used because I didn't wait it. It is because I think I didn't properly secure it in the, say, uh, box. I think that's what it costs because I had like 20 watches. Typically for something like this, we would want to be right around, but I mean, I understand the watch is already here. I'm going to have to discuss it with the buyer because I had to disclose. So let me do this. Let me call the buyer and I will come back with a very, very fair alternative offer. Um, you know, no hard feelings if things go any other direction, but I will do my best to make sure that all parties are happy and we make sure everybody's good. So, yeah, tell him that I didn't use it. It's in the locker. I kept in multiple watches. That's it. Because the leather strap is not used. If you look at it. Totally understand. It happens. It yeah. happens to the best. I get that you may have just put the watch in the wrong. And that's exactly what I was saying when I was looking at the watch. It doesn't necessarily yeah. look like it was necessarily worn. It just looks yeah. like it was perhaps just 
stored improperly, yeah. handled improperly, maybe just simply worn once. So let me let me call you back here shortly. I'm gonna talk to our buyer. And how about the date of the agreement? How, how does it look? To be honest with you, I haven't even looked that far yet. Right now, we're just handling okay. the 5980. I mean, from a glance, it looks okay. I haven't looped okay. it out as well, but I'll call you back on both watches in about five, 10 minutes. I'll call Brad back. <clears throat> I was gonna say like, hey, what, what's gonna make you happy so I can go fight for you? The watch, at a glance, when you look at it on the wrist, it looks brand new. I mean, you really can't see anything wrong with it. There's no deans that are very eye, like, if this was a diamond, we would call this eye clean, right? Like, this would be an eye clean stone, right. blah, 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 blah. But I mean, if we start right. getting with the loop right. and microscopes, we're gonna find little uh, inclusions, right? So that's what you're dealing with here. So what would make you happy just to like, keep the deal moving forward? That's a loaded question. I, I, what, what's gonna make me happy and what's realistic is they're two different things. So just tell me where he's at, where you're at. Give me the, the best figure that you can. And if it works, we'll just do it and move on. I mean, truly, because I'm going to say you, something what lower than what you, it's not going to work. So truthfully, it just matters what you guys want to do and let's figure it out. Honestly, I mean, I mean, would knocking true. off a few grand work for you if I can get that done? Which, which comes out to what? No. Oh, a few, I, I thought I said a few because a few is usually three, a couple is usually two, but I'm not going to split hairs. If you, if you okay. said to me, it's I'll take it. Let me tell the guy I want. Uh, let me just tell the guy two thousand bucks, just because like I, I'm already like, you know, telling him like, and he he kind of already he said knows, like he has to know there's a huge discrepancy between new and mint. You know what I mean? Of course, and I re really explained it to him, and yeah. he kind of already like disclosed that you know he had the watch in a some sort of what do you say some sort of box that it was maybe mishandled, and he was like, yeah, I could see that. And I was like, all right, fine. Then you know. So let me um let me call him back, and then I'll get this deal done for you, and then we'll be good. Okay. Just let me know. All right, thanks. So I got this figured out. It's not a big deal, but yeah, I mean, I can't sell it as new, but I talked to the guy who's gonna buy it. Um, I think we're okay with just two thousand dollars off. If you're good with that, I'll just we'll pursue this. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. You're good with that, right? Yes. Alrighty, thank you so much. Okay, so done deal. As you saw, we were able to resolve resolve the issue. I mean, he he understood that maybe the watch wasn't him. He got it. It may have been worn out of the store. People understand wearing a watch out of the store immediately is going to put wear. Yeah. Somehow, some way, I don't care how delicate you think and you are in your mind, physics just has a, always a different outcome, okay? <laughs> just, I, as soon as I looked at this watch, I could immediately tell, no, this was worn. Not not mishandled, but worn. And I could see the signs of it. Yeah. And of course, what did he say? He said, yes, I wore it out of the store. He may have had lunch with it that day. He may have had dinner. He may have went to the ball. He may have went day. somewhere. I mean, it's so, like, right there. I promise if that was a paddock, we'd probably find that mark if I took a microscope. Yeah. And all I'm saying is like all day, you know, the people are taking their shirts and doing this. It's just, it's going to show up, bro. So end of the day, we got it fixed. What's going on, everyone? My name's Jai. I'm here with Grant Caliber. And we're going to have the team come through and show what their daily is on their wrist and kind of explain, you know, what it means to them, how they got it, and why they chose that to be their daily. So I'll go first. My daily is this AP Royal Oak. Uh, looks like a date just. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, my uh, daily is a white dial date just. It's a 2021. It's uh, my favorite one is obviously the white dial. I always prefer white dials in every watch. And I think the date just is just a really classy piece that everybody, when they think Rolex, a date just does come to mind. And personally, I love the Jubilee bracelet and I just wanted something that I could wear every day, not feel bad about wearing if I scuff it up and stuff. And I think the date just was just ultimately the one that would give me the most pop and the most sport, you know, to watch you can really do yard work in and then go to a wedding in. So it's just very uh, universal for me and my needs. I picked up this watch and ever since I've been wearing it, I just can't stop wearing it. I've had others in the collection and I've just actually sold them all out and kept this as uh, my one basically ride or die kind of watch. So I've been keeping it, uh, it's my 2023 piece and I think I'm gonna just, you know, keep wearing it for quite a while. Okay, so I wanna talk about my favorite watch in my collection and that is this Omega Speedmaster. It's a Sapphire Sandwich. I got it in 2021. This is the watch that means the most to me because I actually got it in New York City on Fifth Avenue at the Omega Boutique, but I got it on my 10 year anniversary in New York. And every time I look at it, I think about that trip. I have two kids, so I don't get to spend a lot of personal time with my wife. And that whole trip was just me and my wife, personal time. And honestly, it's the best vacation that I ever had. I can still remember looking down at this in Times Square and I could see all the lights on the glass. And every time I, I wear this watch, I think about that. And I actually wear it every Tuesday for Speedy Tuesday. And we film on Tuesday, so every Tuesday you'll see this on my wrist. My favorite watch, the 326934, which is the Blue Dial Sky Dweller. 
this particular one on oyster bracelet. I've always been a fan of Jubilee bracelet, but for me, a 42 millimeter watch of this size looks a little bit better on oyster, but this is a dream come true. I've always wanted this watch. Kid you not, Marco, as he always does, comes in with new inventory. I immediately let him know, hey, we have to work a deal on this watch by any means necessary. There's been a lot of watches on my list. I've been through a lot of watches, but the Sky Dweller has always checked all the boxes for me. It has a date function, has a fluted bezel, which pops a little bit. My favorite color is blue. I wanted this watch last year in 2021. Prices were through the roof. I had the white dial that I paid around 20,000 for, and the blue dial at the time was 33,000, an extra 13,000 just for a blue dial. I couldn't justify that until the time was appropriate. A couple months ago, he came in with this piece, started looking at it. We ended up working the deal, traded in the watch that I had at the time, which was a two-tone Wilbedon. Something about the number 11 just aligns perfect with me. I don't care where I'm at. It's one of those ominous things in life that always seems to be a coincidence. So after we work the deal, I go to grab the card to this watch, and boom, the car is dated 11-11. So it just felt like it was meant to be. I have now gotten married in this watch, been on my honeymoon, bottom of the ocean wearing this watch. So definitely has uh, created some sentimental value at the same time. So I get this asked quite a bit, which is what watch am I wearing or what's in my collection? I actually sold a lot of my watches within the last 18 months. Um, I had a Rolex Pepsi, I had a AP Ghost at one point, I had a Panerai 1392, which is my first watch. I had an IWC Portugieser. I've gone through several watches. I had a Rolex 5513, a no-date sub. But the only watch that I wear right now is this Rolex Daytona. It's a black dial ceramic bezel 116500. It's interesting because I've had a lot of watches. I've had, you know, four, five, six watches at one point but I find myself wearing just one watch most of the time. I'm a guy that likes something simple. Like I usually wear the same shoes every single day. I just like to put something on that I love, that I don't have to think about. I don't like rotating between watches. So this to me is a very iconic watch. It has the racing heritage. I love the symmetry of the Daytona. It doesn't have a date feature, which was annoying at first, but I've come to really love it. Now, a lot of people will ask me why I didn't get the Panda Daytona. I think the Panda Daytona, or some people, the reverse Panda, it's the white dial. I think it looks a lot better in pictures, but in person, I think the black dial looks better in person. I'm also usually in business meetings or just meeting people randomly and I don't like things that are too eye-catching like I like subtle things you see the clothes I wear is usually non-branded so this to me is like a a very subtle watch that if you know you know um, it gains respect and and amongst watch dealers but it's not something where if you see it and you don't know anything about watches you're freaking out about it which I really enjoy so this is the only watch that I wear right now it goes for around 24 25 thousand if you can get it retail, I think it's around 13, which if you can get this on retail, you must have some serious connections because uh, even with my 80 connections, I'm still waiting probably eight months to a year on that. So yeah, that's what I'm wearing right now. Rolex Daytona Black Dial. I know everybody's talking about their daily watch, but I've got something special for you. This is a watch that's been with me the longest and it's not quite a crazy piece, but it's not too low on the totem pole to not talk about. I've had this watch since 2018 and it's been with me by my side. It's one of my last, we call it, golden era of Craigslist deals that I used to do back in the day. If you guys saw the opening video for Grand Caliber, you'll recognize this piece. It is a 16030 and it's a little special. We'll show you. First thing you're gonna notice is that dial is actually brown, but it used to be uh, rhodium dial. So it's turned this really beautiful caramel chocolate color. I really love this watch. It sits in my box 99% of the time. However, I do wear it occasionally. You know what, I'll probably wear it today because why not? The story behind this watch is I saw an ad on Craigslist for this watch. I saw loose, really crappy Android photos from back in the day. I'm sure you guys remember when Android phones were taking World War II style photos and that's the best you could get. At the time, when I saw the pictures, I couldn't even make out what dial it had. I just saw that it had appropriate stuff with it, papers, box, booklets, so forth. I knew it was a day jazz and the price point was so, so good I had to make the two and a half hour drive to go get it. Back then I would have driven vast distances to go find the right deal and this was one of them. This watch was 
actually in a trailer park that I had to go drive to, inspected the watch, and didn't know the dial was brown even then because the crystal was so scratched and beat up. I just knew there was something special on it that I couldn't really tell. Kind of, It still looked kind of hazy silver, so I didn't really know. So took it to the watchmaker, swapped the crystal, and this is what came alive. So beautiful watch, I loved it, kept it ever since, and it's not one that I'm ready ever going to part with. I'll just take a look here at the watch. There you go, there's the main grade. Oh, wow. Should be sent to you right to the right time. Wow, that looks so nice. Ooh, that's pretty. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. And this was dated in uh, should be July. The, yeah, it should be the 5th of August, uh, okay. January. Yeah, January 5th, yeah, so 05, so it goes by the date and then the month. So 2023, so super fresh card. And then I'll teach you a little party trick on these cards. I don't know if you know this, but you can take the card, a good way to kind of tell if you have a real <laughs> card or not, is you take the card and you scan your phone over it. Oh, okay. uh, oh wow. It's off the Rolex website. Wow. There you yeah, go. so okay. they, uh, the fakes have not quite gotten there. So we took through our full authentication process though. And it did come. Oh, perfect, it's set and everything, huh? Mm-hmm. I had a couple links removed. We don't know what size you are. So I, I do have, have well. like I, I do have another one with the Jubilee bracelet. And I had two links removed. Is it the same on? Yeah, it might be right oh. there. We got two links right here. Okay. Maybe Let's try it on see how it fits. But yeah, you do have the, the white tag. I know we were. You, you got the tag. Yeah, yeah. You okay. Got the both tags. So you got the green tag and the white. Tag. Wow, that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> that's convenient. That's perfect. <laughs> so that's five minutes of work there. Oh, I like it. So I was looking at the 41, but I think it was a little too big. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, no, 36, 36, 36 as well. well. And then um, I'm not sure if you noticed, but if you pop the bracelet, you actually have a micro extension. Right. So if it gets, if your wrist swells, you can actually extend it out a little bit. And then y'all said y'all have like a one year warranty. Yeah, one year warranty happens. through us in house. And then, so yeah, if anything happens weird with the watch, and then also since it is such a brand new watch, you have a five year warranty with Rolex from the day yeah. of the card. And fluted bezel, I'm and sure you know that's all white. Your, Fit right now. Yeah. Oh yeah, did you wear that I, one yeah. Well, I changed because I came back from work and then yeah. I was like, I need to change real quick. Yeah. Then, no, absolutely. But you should just wear that out. I know. Are you gonna wear it tonight? I might. Should I wear it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It'll, it'll and I'm sure you know the Jubilee. It's nice. You cover up a lot of scratches on the right. bracelet. The clasp, unfortunately, eventually, I don't know how careful you can be. Eventually, we'll show some wear. Right. And but, do y'all have like a cleaning cloth by any chance? Yeah, because I, I had like. Oh, Just perfect. Check right. that out. Oh, this is a Rolex oh, one? Yeah. Nice. Well, thank you guys. I mean, like, yeah, I watch y'all's videos and stuff. That's how I heard about you guys yeah. and Marco and yeah. everything else. So. Yeah, unfortunately, he's not cool. here right now. I'm trying to get yeah. Okay. So, you guys have like uh, inventory in there? Yeah, you Could I, can I take a look at some stuff? Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. yeah oh my gosh, like, I'm so excited. Right. <laughs> yeah, I uh, looked at like the Omega Speedmaster 57s, yeah. the new ones that came out. Yeah. yeah. And I saw the green dial and I was like, oh, that one's like super nice. And I went back and forth between the green and the blue. Mm -hmm. But and then I finally like put on the 57. Yeah. And then it, w it didn't like fit as well. Mm -hmm. And then so I already had like the 36 Explorer and I was like, you know, that one fit perfectly. Yeah. So I was like, I love the mint green. And then when this came out with the fluted bezel and the Jubilee. Yeah, like, it's done deal. Yeah. yeah. Cause I, I like like the day date Prezi, but I was like, this is as close as I can probably, I mean, it's a completely different watch, but. Well, I yeah. say, it has a similar vibe because it has the Jubilee, which kind of looks like the President. Yeah, like the platinum. Yeah, and then the flute of bezel, which they got. Right. Oh yeah. I like this. Yeah, the green. That looks nice. It's it's one the speed mask. Yeah. It's kind of like a skeleton dial, kind of like. Yeah, you can see a little deeper into it. This is kind of yeah. unique too. Oh, that IWC. Yeah, we'll be back for her piece next time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> can you watch the channel a little? Um, when he would come over, he would watch it, <laughs> yeah. and then I'll, I'll come home nice. like, yeah, how long have you been watching it Yeah, I've been watching it for a couple of years now. Oh, nice. Yeah, because you guys had, I mean, before, I was watching it before as well. Yeah. And then just recently, I started watching it again, and I was like, well, I'll give them a call, and everything worked out perfectly. Yeah, that's so, great. I'm glad we could help. Yeah, yeah, thank you so absolutely, much. Absolutely, absolutely. Welcome back to this behind-the-scenes segment here at Grand Caliber. I have a relatively new face here. Uh, his name is Chris. Chris is coming in as our chief operating officer, COO. <laughs> it's something yeah. with these titles that we, we we just throw around here at Grand Caliber. But I think the question that everyone may have is, what do you actually do here, Chris? A lot of things, but right now, primarily, it's focusing on the sales team. We have a great group of individuals back there that have been doing an excellent job, but you know, we really need to put in place processes and proper follow-up and bring in the CRM and really create some true sales professionals. Great people, they've been very successful at what we're doing, but we're just trying to turn it up a notch now. You've been here for almost a month now. What What's one thing within that sales team 
that you've noticed, good or bad? Yeah, there's a lot of good. There, there's definitely some bad and they know it. Let's start with the bad first and then I'll get into the good. Uh, the bad is just prioritizing their time. We have a lot of leads coming in, uh, a lot of leads that were getting left behind and it's not because they didn't want to get to them. They just were focused on different areas and then you know completely forgot about the leads or how to use, properly use the CRM. So definitely response time is one of the biggest challenges. Yeah, I think those are things that we've wanted to improve for quite some time. I've I've shared that with the viewers over the last several months. And for me, it was always trying to find the right person to help our company address that. It's not a short-term fix. I think some of the big things I think you and I have talked about is if you come in and you just hound people with numbers or some type of just short-term, what do you call it, like motivator, the production is very limited. It might explode for a week, two weeks, a month, and then it's not sustainable. What are some of the things that you've tried to incorporate so far that that's worked? Well, to your point, you know, one of the biggest things that I talk about, and you guys have heard me say it numerous times, is if you focus on the behaviors, you'll improve your numbers. So our sales team doesn't have to focus on those numbers and think about how many people they're going to talk to. If they just do the right thing, do the right connections, do the right follow-up, everything else will come. Right. So just making sure we're doing everything correct. Uh, you had a second part to that question that I forgot. I probably also forgot that. <laughs> or what, what are things that you've done to to try to address some of those issues? Yeah. The biggest thing is starting with the basics right now. I can't come in and just, you know, help everybody fix everything all at once. And the basics are just making sure that every client that ends up reaching out to us is being contacted back and within a reasonable amount of time. So I've been made, I've made sure to stay on the team and, you know, anytime that there's a lead that it's a little bit of time before they've been responded to, asking about what's going on with it, helping out if I can. So if they're really busy, they don't have the capacity to get back to them, like I might respond back to you and just try to figure out some information to help out the sales team. But just the basic things right now are 100% communication with all of our clients that are reaching out. And that's something that we've talked about, again, quite a bit. I don't think the industry does a good job of this at all in terms of follow-up. I've been on the consumer side. I, I know you've been on the consumer side where I've reached out to numerous great dealers and sometimes it takes hours, if not days for a response. And that's something that we really want to improve here at Grand Caliber. If I'm watching this video, my question is, what makes you qualified for this role? I mean, tell us a little bit about your background and, and what you've done in the past. I've spent the majority of my career in learning and development. Actually, let me back up to the very beginning. I actually started out in sales. I've sold uh, cell phones for a long time, especially whenever they were booming, gym memberships, uh, you know, commercial construction. So I've been in a lot of different sales industries, but I really found a passion for helping people, um, you know, connect with people, ask the right questions, do the true process. And I fell in love with the training world. And so for the past 15 years, I've been in a leadership or training role specifically around sales and training people how to do the processes correctly. What's really interesting is how Chris even came uh, to Grand Caliber and that whole process. You want to walk them through <laughs> that that type of uh, experience? Yeah, yeah. So again, learning and development. I'm a trainer. And I was watching one of the videos that Jimmy put out, and I heard him mention sales trainer. And I'm like, hey, I absolutely love watches. I love the channel. Why not just shoot Jimmy an email? Shot Jimmy an email and said, hey, you know, I, I am a trainer. I focus on sales. I'd be interested in coming and helping, you know, consult for you all. Jimmy ignored me for a long time. <laughs> eventually ended up getting back to me. And uh, we worked out a deal to where I came down here, I believe it was in the summer, uh, helped out the team, went through some just different sales processes and behaviors. And I guess you guys liked what I, I had to offer and, you know, kept trying to get me to join the team. I had no, you know, ambition on joining the team because I, I was really happy where I was at. I was in Louisville, Kentucky, had my family, had a really great job. But the more I was talking to Jimmy, the more intrigued I got. I've never been in an industry in sales where I'm passionate about what I'm selling and that absolutely helps. So, you know, that was a big deciding factor, but honestly, this team, I came here and I met the entire team. I realized a really great, genuine people and I almost felt sad going home because I knew there was a lot of work to do and I really enjoyed my time with you all. I felt like we connected really well and something just kept drawing me to the team. So I'm, I'm glad that it worked out. Yeah, it was a fairly long process. I mean, I think I spent probably close to three months recruiting him after he came out to meet the team. 
getting your wife, your kids on board. I mean, this is a big move yeah. where he relocated from Kentucky. So I think that was like a three month recruiting process. It was. And if anybody ever doubts my sales ability, I talked to my wife into moving from her hometown, Louisville, Kentucky, here to Dallas, Texas, and just pack up and move. But that should show how much I believe in Grand Caliber and the team here. I mean, I'm moving my wife and my two kids. I have a 13-year-old and an 8-year-old. So it's a complete different change for us. We've never lived anywhere other than Southern Indiana, Louisville, Kentucky area. We went through a lot of different applicants. And, you know, there's a lot that goes into it, right? There's not only does this person have the right skill set, is this person going to be a fit with the team? You know, is this person that someone that's going to be here long term and sees the vision? I think a lot of times people have issues where you hire these people, but they not they might not share the same vision, right? And that's the mm -hmm. the key is you have to have the same vision. What I always think back to, what's really funny is when we agree to do the sales training, he's like, "Hey, I will come out during this time, these dates." I said, great, no communication for probably two or three weeks. The week before he's, I think it's like two days before you're supposed to arrive, he like emails me, he's like, hey, like, am I still coming out? I'm like, yeah, right, you're, you're coming. There was no follow up in between and most of that's my fault, but it's the reality is like, I just wanna see how proactive people are. Like I, I agreed ahead of my calendar. If you need me to hold your hand and, and you know reach back out, then as sales, maybe you're not as persistent. It was. Very interesting how it worked out, but we're glad that you're here. I think moving forward, you're going to get a lot more uh, behind the scenes segments with myself, Chris, Deja, a combination of one of us three. But, you know, you have Chris right now really developing the sales team. You have Deja that's head of our operations team, and I'm kind of in between. So, yeah, a lot more behind the scenes. I just wanted to introduce Chris to you guys just because he's a newer face and you probably don't know much about him. But we're super excited to have him here. And in the first month you're here, I think production has increased by at least 30%, 40%. Yeah, but none of it's me, man. I haven't sold one watch. That's that's the sales team. <laughs> that's why you, <laughs> your leadership and development. But uh, appreciate it for, uh, appreciate you coming on this week and hopefully we'll have you on moving forward. Absolutely. He's gonna check my SQ5 and I'm gonna get his R7 plus some cash. The viewers are gonna think I'm going broke. But it's one of the opposites <laughs> happening. I may not buy any car and start stacking my money towards actual investments. People want to buy watches from people who think are winning. So that's why all these watch dealers buy and drive all these fucking fancy cars. Did you see the latest thing uh, on, uh, on Reddit? Oh geez, Reddit? I love Reddit. What's going on with Reddit? Uh, one of the Luxury Bazaar guys posted a picture of him in a Lamborghini. He's like one of the new sales reps. And he's in a Lambo? Yeah. That's appropriate. That's what happens when you work in this industry for a couple months. <laughs> Is it his or are you real with the what's I don't know. Yeah, I'm uh I'm comfortable with my car unless you buy this one and I'll take your R7. Look, right now, look, I'm gonna be honest, I'm at a point where I don't really care about cars right now. I don't I agree. I'll give you this car and some and some moolah for your R7. You can have the R7, I don't care. Well, I need it I to get out of the shop. Oh no, no no no, hold on. You know what you're buying. As is. Yeah. Is there a is there a Marco Nicolini uh, warranty? Listen, you buy R7 from me, it stays in the shop. We just listen, you never <laughs> You never, you never quite. Oh, you can never. You never quite own <laughs> an Audi Audi R7. You only hold it for the next, the next generation. Yes. First off, I get ridiculed quite a bit because because I say Audi when it's Audi. It's definitely Audi. Audi. Me as ESL English as as a second language. I say English is not I, I say second Audi. <laughs> Fine, <laughs> Audi. That sounded natural too. <laughs> On an actual business note, we're gonna have a full time security guard at the front. Actually, if there's any security guards out there. Preferably with obviously extensive background in not just being a security guard, but maybe some military background, police background, things like that. Apply. We're gonna have a full time uh, personnel at the store. We go to IWJG or we fly somewhere, go to whatever event. We've had security in the past, but it's usually a, a hired service. I'd rather have someone that we're comfortable with, that we've worked with on a daily basis. Have we discussed on camera the idea that we might be going to ground floor? No, because I don't want to necessarily... You don't want to put that out there? Put that out there. It's something that I think the viewers kind of... Agree. All right, we could talk about I it. mean, look, at the end of the day, you guys out there know that like there's two big pieces missing in the Grand Caliber vision. And that's obviously the location which right now we're on the second floor of an office. That's not the greatest place for a, you know, centralized watch shop to be in my opinion. I think we, and I've been preaching this to Jimmy forever, we need to be on the ground. Other watch companies that I know, they're all on the ground and they all have another thing on top of us. They have a build out of some sort where they actually look the part 
and it's part, and they have accessibility to what they are. You know, we've talked about this so many times and have either changed or pivot or delayed it. This is where we're at. We have insurance on our watches, obviously, but we've hit the insurance limit. To increase our insurance limit, we have to add more safes. So we bought two more safes and the structural engineer came out for our building and have determined that we can't add two more safes. We might be able to add one for an additional million dollars of insurance coverage. Well, at the rate that we're growing, I mean, Marco alone did over a million dollars in revenue this month. We're gonna need probably, let's say, four to five more safes in the next 12 to 18 months, or the thought of building a full-on vault. But the problem is, with the weight restrictions, we can't do that. So now we're actually in conversations with our landlord to potentially move to a ground floor. We didn't think it was gonna be an issue because on the second floor where we are, we're above a parking structure. So there's probably five, six, seven feet of concrete. The structural engineer still said, hey, there's certain beams that run certain ways. Putting those safes there would be too much weight on those beams. So the landlord is generous enough to have a conversation because we can't necessarily terminate our lease. They're gonna have a conversation of moving us to a ground floor location, which now talks about this build out again. And, and I know it's been talked about quite a bit, but before we wanted it, and we, we think we need it from a sales perspective, but now we truly need it from a liability perspective. From a liability perspective, correct. But from a sales perspective, not necessarily. All it's gonna do is open the door for more foot traffic to actually happen, which foot, foot traffic would obviously convert into sales. Just having that crown jewel presentation is going to be such a big difference. And not only like, I think it's just gonna create a whole different culture. On top of that, it's gonna motivate these sales guys even more. If you're like inside of a really nice, you know, luxurious feeling watch shop versus no offense to us. I, mean, I don't know, <laughs> but it is it, what it is. It is what it is. I mean, it's almost like we're working out of like a paper shop. It doesn't have that vibe. It doesn't have that essence. And like, you got to think all of our clients and everybody that shops at Grand Caliber are the same people that are shopping at the, the finest malls, the finest establishment and everywhere they go. Anytime they make a purchase, their experience there was very luxurious customer service, dress code, everything was met. You know, and, and then when they come to us, right now we're still obviously in the building phase, but that's the one thing I lack that we, I feel like we lack is that presentation. Because of that, along with the insurance liability of, you know, needing more insurance coverage, it's prompted the conversation to truly evaluate this. And it's starting to impact our business because we're selling watches very fast, which is helpful. We don't have to sit on the inventory. That affects our margins. So the ability to sit on an inventory a little bit longer in the right circumstance would be great to achieve higher margins. But to do that, we got to make sure that we're still covered with our insurance policy. It's okay right now because watches are coming in, they're going out, they're being sold. So those are things we got to think about and things that we got to improve on. And we're not going to talk about it every single episode, but there are serious discussions about moving locations to a ground floor. Inevitably, it'll happen. It will happen. Let's roll. All right, we're here at Eatsy's. I've been hearing from Alfred about these wings that they have. He says they're the greatest wings that he's ate in- Fucking hell. Our camera guy almost <laughs> fell. Uh, this is apparently the greatest wings in Dallas. I've been trying to get it for the last week and a half, but today I'm gonna try it. That's why we're going to Eatsy's. That's why we're here. Oh. I'm not eating, that's not food. You so healthy nowadays? Yeah, I'm, I'm eating rabbit food. I exceeded my weight limit.